Hey there, welcome to Calvary Monterey. We are excited that you're tuning in with us. We have a great service prepared for you. We are a church that strives to see the glory of God exemplified in your life. So if you're joining us for the first time or have been watching for a while, we would love to come alongside of you and do life together. Text the number on the screen and let's get connected. We have a wonderful time of worship prepared, so let's align our hearts together to give Jesus praise. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege, the honor that it is to worship you. Lord, it's amazing to me that you would accept this act of worship. Would you receive these songs, these songs that are helping us express our hearts, our emotions, our thoughts about you to you. May you use it, Lord, to edify us, and may you be blessed by it. Amen. You can have my yes with no exception laying down my rights to second guessing you can have my yes I'm giving you my fears of never knowing whatever's coming next I know you've got me you can have my yes you're the lamp, you're the light, you're the cloud that guides me you're the way, you're the truth, you're the life inside me. You conquer my fears, I'll leave it all behind. I'm running to the light. I'm running to the light. I'm giving you my dreams and my ambitions. Your presence is my prize and my provision I'll answer when you ask oh, Who could come against if you are for me? Cause even in the fire I know you've got me I'm giving you my yes again You're the lamp, you're the light, you're the cloud that guides me you're the way, you're the truth, you're the life inside me. You conquer my fears, so I'll leave it all behind. I'm running to the light. Oh, wherever you are, wherever you want to go, I'll follow. Oh, wherever you are, wherever you want to go, I'll follow. Oh, wherever you are, wherever you want to go, I'll follow. I'll follow you. Oh, wherever you are, wherever you want to go, I'll follow. Oh, wherever you are, wherever you want to go, I'll follow. Oh, wherever you are, wherever you want to go, I'll follow, I'll follow you. You're the lamp, you're the light, you're the cloud that guides me. You're the way, you're the truth, you're the life inside me. You conquer my fears, so I'll leave it all behind. I'm running to the light. into the light I'm running to Jesus Christ I'm running to the light In our gatherings, Jesus has a special opportunity to deposit his word into our souls. He does this to comfort and grow us but also to establish his church on truth. Let's take a moment to read about the power of Jesus' gospel and pray in these truths as we continue to worship. 
Colossians 3, verse 16 says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart.
the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Oh, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Oh, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope, oh my living Seal the promise Your buried body Began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declare the grave Has no claim on me Then came the morning That sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me oh jesus yours is the victory Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. i 
this grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope oh god you are my living hope. As we celebrate Jesus together, you may be prompted to know what else you can do to worship God today. One of the ways we can continue to worship God is through our generosity. If you would like to worship God through your giving, you can text the number on the screen. Let's celebrate Jesus and commit our giving to the Lord. Thank you, God, for the privilege that it is to give to you. Lord, you take these resources that you've given to us. You've given us the ability to work for them, to earn them. And Lord, now, because that's from you, Father, we give it back to you. Thank you, Lord, for your generosity. We, in turn, want to be generous to you, Lord. Thank you. We know that we can't outgive you. And so, Father, may you take this token, no matter how small or how big it is, and Lord, may you use it for your purposes. Thank you, God, for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, everyone. Today, we're going to begin a short study of the book of Jonah, a familiar tale, but one that I think is helpful to believers in every generation and will definitely be helpful to us in ours. Uh, today we're going to look at Jonah chapter 1 if you want to get situated there in your Bibles. And as you're turning there, I would love to reiterate for those of you watching or listening to this before this coming weekend uh, that we have our intentional parenting conference. And I long for the parents of this church to build well a plan for helping their children be passionate Jesus followers. So I pray that you can come out this Friday and Saturday night, or at the very least, buy and read the book, Raising Passionate Jesus Followers, by the speakers at our conference, Phil and Diane Comer. Okay, today, Jonah chapter 1. Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you and pray that our hearts would be ready and receptive to hear what you might say in the pages of these four chapters. In Jesus' name, amen. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord, verse 4, hurled a great wind upon the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps... The God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Well, Jonah, like many of the Old Testament prophetic books, begins with the word of the Lord came to his prophet. Uh, we don't know much about this prophet except from this book. His name was Jonah, the son of Amittai. And there's not a lot of background material about him in the historical books of Israel's history. The tiny bit that we do know comes from 2 Kings chapter 14. It tells us there that he prophesied 
to King Jeroboam of Israel that after many hard and bleak years that they'd just gone through, the borders of Israel would finally be restored. It was good news. It was peace and prosperity. That was the message of Jonah. So Jonah had been a prophet with good news for Israel, but now, as we just read in these opening verses, he's tasked with bringing bad news to Nineveh, a city, a large city, a great city, it says, over 500 miles from Jonah's location in Israel. He had, in the past, had a positive message for God's believing people, but now he's tasked with a negative message for unbelieving people. But the prophet did an uncharacteristic thing, at least uncharacteristic for a prophet. He ran from God, or at least he tried to run from God. Uh, he decided to go to Tarshish. Uh, a city far away and in the opposite direction of Jonah's assignment. Uh, after finding a boat that would take him on as a passenger, Jonah, it says, paid the fare and settled in for the long journey. Uh, but God would not allow his man to run for very long. He, instead, he hurled a great wind upon the sea, and the tempest that resulted threatened to break up the ship. So all the sailors on board grew fearful and cried out, it says, to their gods. When there was no response from any of their gods, and the Bible reader would expect that to be the case, the captain then comes and awakes Jonah so that Jonah could pray to his god. Some wonder if Jonah was sleeping because he had a false sense of peace as he ran from God. I wonder if he was a mere land lover who could only cope with his odd mixture of seasickness and feelings of conviction because he was rebelling against God. The only way he could deal with it was by not thinking about it and just going to sleep. But the question that we need to ask is, why did Jonah run? This is the major question of this first movement and a key to understanding the entire book and how it applies to us today. Now, it can't be that Jonah ran because he was concerned about the difficulty of traveling 500 miles to Nineveh. Any Israelite in Jonah's day would have chosen a 500-mile journey on foot over a 1,000-mile journey by sea. Either journey was rigorous, but the ocean was a dreaded and mysterious thing in ancient Israel. Perhaps Jonah was fearful about what would happen to him once he was in Nineveh. This is a reasonable response to the question, why did Jonah run? Because Assyria was one of the cruelest and most violent empires in the world, and Nineveh was its capital city. Their kings wrote boasts of atrocities and war crimes uh, that would make your skin crawl, make you squirm in your seat right now. The, the ways that they would humiliate opponents and torture their captives were legendary. So Jonah might have feared for his personal safety uh, in going to a town like Nineveh. But I think that this answer to the question, why did Jonah run, it overlooks the rest of the book of Jonah. At the end of his story, Jonah admits his own reason for running from God's will. He actually says it with his own words. Jonah, spoiler alert, eventually did go to Nineveh in the second half of the book, and everyone there repented of their evil at the result of Jonah's preaching. And God responded. God relented from the disaster of the judgment that he said he would bring upon them. And when Jonah saw this, he said in Jonah 4 verse 2, O oh Lord, 
Is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. So Jonah's reason, according to Jonah himself, for rebelling against God had to do with what he knew about God. Other prophets had predicted judgment on surrounding nations, but whenever they gave their predictions, they did so from the safety of Israel. Their prophecies really weren't for their target cities and nations, but for Israel to listen to so that they trust God in the face of these massive opponents and armies that surrounded them. But if God was sending Jonah to Nineveh, and since God is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, Jonah understood that that probably meant that God was going to show his grace and mercy and patience and love to the Ninevites. And Jonah did not like that. He was used to telling God's people that their borders would be restored. He didn't want to tell people far from God even a word of judgment, lest they repent and become God's people. This is where I want to point out that God is a sending God because it's his nature. He sends us as the church into the world to declare the gospel. He sent Jonah to the Ninevites. He sent his only begotten son. God sends because it is his merciful, gracious, patient, and loving nature to do so. But though Jonah's theology about God was accurate, though he believed the right things about God, though he knew that God was gracious, he only liked it when it applied to him and his people, not when it applied to those people, the Ninevites. So Jonah decided to live out his own desires rather than allow his actions to flow from what he knew about God. That's why I've called our brief study in the book of Jonah unhitched. Like a train car unhitched from the locomotive, Jonah was unhitched from God and God's nature. God's heart, God's nature, the things he stated himself to be to Moses on Mount Sinai in the law so many years before did not impact Jonah as it should. Jonah should have seen who God is and then lived in a way that represented God's nature well. Instead, he unhitched. I almost called this study, the caboose is loose. Because Jonah is like the last train car, unhitching himself from following God into Ninevite territory. Make no mistake, God is the main character of the book of Jonah. It's not Jonah, it's not the fish, it's not the Ninevites, it's God. He's mentioned twice as much as Jonah in this book. He sent Jonah. After causing a storm and sending a great fish, God listened to his prophet. After seeing Nineveh's repentance, God responded to the Ninevites. And after tolerating Jonah's tantrum about it all in Jonah chapter 4, God trained his prophet. God is the one working and doing and moving all throughout this book. His man is defective, but he is not. And I want to say here that the big mission of God in this book was not to reach the Ninevites, but to reach his people. Jonah knew the right things about God, but didn't understand the magnitude of God's grace. So he hated the people of Nineveh. 
And this book was originally written for an Israelite audience who had the same heart or perspectives that their prophet did. As God's people, they were called to be a light to the world, a kingdom of priests to a world in need. But they had become so insular and so angry that they couldn't fulfill their mission. But now Christ has come and has fulfilled the Old Testament for us. The book of Jonah, it now belongs to us as the church. We are God's people and God's message is the same. Understand who I am. I am gracious and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. I sent my son to save people from their sin. And I want you to deliver this message to all nations, even when it's scary. This is not a book exclusively for people called to missions or the pastorate, but who are running from their calling. It's for all believers because we are all called to love the world by demonstrating and proclaiming the gospel. In other words, we must both love God and neighbor. We cannot properly worship without witness. As John Stott once wrote, a Christianity which would use the vertical preoccupation as a means to escape from its responsibility for and in the common life of man is a denial of the incarnation, of God's love for the world manifested in Christ. Well, that's the first movement of the book of Jonah, chapter 1, but let's read the second of three movements. It says in verse 7 that the crew said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Now in this second movement, the crew, along with Jonah, cast lots as a method to determine the, the cause, the person at fault for this obviously supernatural storm. Uh, they might have done this by passing around a bag of rocks, all of which were black on the inside except for one white stone that Jonah selected. Uh, there were a number of other ways that they might have cast lots, so to speak, to determine who was at fault. This was a common way for ancients to try to discern the will, the thoughts, the intentions of the divine. And as God does all book long, he flexes his sovereignty and caused the lot to fall on Jonah. Immediately, the sailors interrogated Mo, uh, Jonah with an avalanche of questions. And all the questions had embarrassing answers. The question, what is your occupation? Answer, I'm one of God's prophets. We're supposed to go wherever and say whatever God tells us to say. Question, where do you come from? Answer, well, I come from Israel, the place that the true God resides in his temple. Question, who are your people? Answer, we're Hebrews, God's specially called people, that we might demonstrate the true God to the world around us. Uh, but Jonah didn't back away from these answers. Leading with his identity as a Hebrew, Jonah revealed to them that he belonged to God, but was trying to flee from his presence. Now, I've already pointed out that God is a sending God, and that this action of sending flows from his nature, flows from the very being, the core of who God is. But I want to emphasize a bit more, secondly, that God sends his people so that we might represent him well. Jonah, of course, was not doing a good job of this. 
It's tempting to call a study of Jonah what not to do, the life of Jonah. And here we have him on the boat amid his rebellion telling everyone that he belongs to God. One major reason that many modern people give for refusing to believe in God and his gospel is hypocrisy in the church. I'm sure you've heard this. It reminds me of a character in Moby Dick who sought to learn from Christian sailors but said that the practices of whalemen soon convinced him that even Christians could be miserable and wicked, infinitely more so than all his father's heathens. What are we to do about this charge? None of us can expect to always and at all times represent Jesus without error. I mean, if you've trusted in Jesus, he's given you a new heart, a, a new nature, but that doesn't mean that you always automatically do the right thing, say the right thing, represent God in the right way. We still have a body of sin. We're compelled by sinful desires and appetites. And those appetites often lead us into hypocritical actions that are inconsistent with God and his gospel. So what should we do? Should we strive for perfection? We cannot. We know we won't attain it. Instead, we must be humble and contrite when we fall short. Jonah had fallen short, yet God used even his rebellion to reach people. These sailors heard about God, learned about God, I think were converted to believe in God in part because of Jonah's error. And God might use your stories of failure and weakness to reach other people as well if you humbly repent and show godly contrition and then turn from it. But we're called to represent the Lord through our lives. Jesus said that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. Now, the love of neighbor includes how we treat each other in the body of Christ. Jesus said that all people would know that we are his disciples if we have love for one another. It reminds me of a pastor friend of mine who has two elementary school-aged sons. Uh, they are energetic boys, and as pastors' kids do, they sometimes get tired of waiting around at the church campus uh, long into Sunday for their parents to be done talking with people. One Sunday, they began playfully warring against each other in the empty church sanctuary while their parents talked to people outside. One of them picked up a church pew Bible and threw it at his brother. That was his weapon of choice. And it hit his brother in a crucial spot just below the waistline. Ouch. It even necessitated a quick trip to the ER. Poor kid. It reminds me of how often we treat each other, using even the Bible to attack and devour. It must not be. Love must predominate among the church, for the church, because who in the world would want to join a warring family? We might resist this message a bit by thinking that the world has no business assessing us, no business assessing the church, our behavior, our actions, our love. But Jesus said, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This seems to imply that people will assess our lives and are expected to do so. As Paul said of himself and his ministry team, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We are, in other words, representing our king here on earth. God sends us to represent him well. Well, let's conclude with the last movement of this first chapter of Jonah. It said, Then they said to Jonah, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, 
Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now in this final movement of this opening chapter or story, the sailors, having determined that Jonah is the cause of the worsening storm, asked Jonah what they should do with him. Jonah told them to pick him up and throw him overboard, hurl him into the sea. Uh, If they did, the sea would become calm for them. But rather than behave as Jonah expected unbelieving Gentile pagan sailors to behave, uh, these men were very nice. They instead began rowing hard to get Jonah back to shore. They were not bloodthirsty, but instead did not want innocent blood, they said, to be on their hands. Uh, But eventually it became obvious that they had no other choice. And so these men prayed to God, they asked for mercy, and they threw Jonah overboard. Uh, When the sea immediately stopped raging and peace came into their lives, These men did not forget God like so many of us do when trials subside, but instead they worshiped God. I think this was a genuine thing happening in their hearts. Though the story was over for the sailors, it was not over for Jonah. God had appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. It was likely a large whale. Ancient Hebrews kept their distance from the ocean's waters and used The same word as fish to describe whales. And Jonah, rather miraculously, I think, was in the belly of the fish for at least part of three days and three nights. Now the great question of this movement is, why did Jonah tell the sailors to throw him into the sea? Some think that Jonah was still seething about his assignment to Nineveh, So by telling them to throw him overboard, he was resigning himself to death. If this is true, Jonah is saying something like, it would be better for me to die in the Mediterranean than preach to the Ninevites. I would rather die than see people like that converted. Others on the opposite end of the spectrum think that Jonah had a major change of heart through the events of the storm. The kindness of the sailors and the magnitude of the storm might have brought him to a place of compassion. If this is true, Jonah is saying something like, I want you all to live. And there's only one way for that to happen. You've got to throw me overboard and I will die instead of you. Now, this second view has appeal because it reminds us of Jesus, the one who died for the many. But it forgets Jonah's attitude in the second half of the book. Even in the end, Jonah was not happy about salvation for people outside the believing community. The truth of Jonah's attitude. Why did he tell them to throw him overboard? It likely lies somewhere in the middle. This was, after all, a messy moment in the midst of a tumultuous storm. Who was thinking straight in a time like that? Linear, tempered, or logical thought, it's long gone. Jonah, at this point, is likely a mix of adrenaline and fear and regret and depression, and anger, and perhaps even recognition of what he's done to these poor sailors. 
He probably looked into their anxious faces and realized their humanness. But years of nationalistic enthusiasm probably also clouded his judgment. Nevertheless, his bottom line conclusion was right. He had to go overboard. You see, true love is substitutionary. It's sacrificial. Recently, Christina and I, we were watching a show on Netflix about families in India who've hired a matchmaker to find a spouse for their adult children. Uh, one of these adult children was a woman who badly wanted to be married, seemed to be a successful, beautiful woman, but expressed a long list of requirements before admitting that she didn't want her life to change in any way once married. That is not love. I mean, if it's any kind of love, it's over-the-top self-love. It's not sacrificial. Jonah sacrificed himself. He substituted himself for the sailors. And in doing so, became a picture of Jesus Christ. The one who substituted himself for all of humanity on the cross. Jesus even pointed this out, claiming Jonah as the perfect sign for what he was about to do. He said in Matthew 12, verse 39, No sign will be given to this generation except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This is where... I want to conclude today's teaching. Yes, God sends because it's his nature to do so. Yes, God sends so that we might represent him well. But ultimately, God sent himself. Like Jonah, one died so that we all might live. Jesus came to our storm-tossed world and threw himself into the waves of God's wrath so that we might survive. And though Jonah became like so many of the Old Testament characters, a picture pointing forward to Jesus, the differences between Jonah and Jesus are staggering. Jonah was cast out of the boat for his own sins. Jesus was cast out or crucified. For ours. Jonah only came near death when he went under the waters, but was miraculously preserved by the great fish. Jesus passed under the true darkness of death. Jonah was unwilling to participate in God's mission. Jesus eagerly came to earth in obedience to the Father. For Christ, the one who spent three days and nights in death before he rose again. For Christ we rejoice. But our passage, it's asking us to do more than rejoice. It wants us to go, to see ourselves as sent into a broken world where, yes, evil exists everywhere. The sending God who sent himself, wants to send us. When Jonah ran from God, the first place that he went was to the coastal town of Joppa. There he found a ship so that he could head in the opposite direction of God's will. Centuries later, about 10 years after Jesus died and rose again, some Christians were gathered in that very same town, in Joppa. At that time, the church was still exclusively Jewish. In one house, as these believers prepared lunch downstairs, Peter, the apostle, was up on the rooftop portico praying to God. Then and there, he received a vision. A vision that told him to go up the coast to Caesarea and preach to a Roman army officer and his household. God was telling Peter to preach 
to the non-Jewish nations about Jesus. Peter, there in Joppa, the very city that Jonah launched away from God's will, had a decision. Do I also run from God's mission or do I allow God to send me? Fortunately, for most of us listening to this today, Peter accepted God's invitation and the gospel began to go to the whole world. Joppa, the city known for Jonah's rebellion against God's plan to reach the Ninevites, became the launching pad for God's plan to reach the nations. And we are the recipients, as well as the conduits of that mission, called to preach the gospel to our world, because we have ascending God. God bless you, church. I pray that you have a wonderful week and that I get to see you soon. Hey church, I'm Pastor Matt. I oversee our family ministries and we want to show you what's going on here at Calvary. Ladies, the Women's Conference is coming up in just a few months and the theme of this conference is saying yes to kingdom living. It's based on the call that Jesus gave to his followers to be kingdom minded. Sharon Thomas, who is a gifted speaker and leader for the women's ministry called Established Footsteps, will be the speaker for this conference. We're really excited to have Sharon. She's passionate about cheering on women to love the Word of God and to establish their daily life in truth. So women, you are invited. Mark your calendars and consider who you can invite to the conference. Parents, we're gonna be hosting a two-day parenting conference called Intentional Parenting this coming weekend, and we are so excited. We're gonna be watching the Intentional Parenting film series presented by Phil and Diane Comer. We're gonna have Q&A times with some of our pastors and their wives and discussion times. We love this next generation, and that's why we wanna come alongside you as parents to raise sons and daughters who love God with all of their heart and will follow Jesus all the days of their life. So it's not too late to sign up. Register today. Child care is provided for free, but we ask that you register your child ages one through fifth grade. You can do that on our website. For more information, visit calvary.com for that. We hope you can join us tonight for our next prayer night. We'll be meeting at 6 p.m. in the main sanctuary to spend the evening praying for our entire church family and community. The purpose of these prayer times is simply to gather and pray. So there's not going to be worship or teaching. The grill will be closed. We're not offering Calvary kids for this night. Really the heart is to spend time seeking the Lord together as a group of believers. So we invite you to come and join us. Church, we are so blessed to see how God has been adding to our kids ministry over the past few months. Our vision for Calvary Kids is to partner with parents to help kids know, love, and follow Jesus. Every week we get the opportunity to point them to the Lord and to come alongside them in their faith. And man, in order to make that happen, we have an incredible team of volunteers. And we're asking that God would add to our volunteer team. And we want to invite you to consider joining our Calvary Kids Ministry. If you're thinking about serving in kids ministry, I would invite you to do one of three things. You could visit the Welcome Center today during the 9 and 1030 service. I'll be there. I can talk to you. You can email me at mattk at calvary.com or you can go to calvary.com slash serve and fill out the kids ministry serve form. We want you to watch this video of some of our volunteers' experience serving in Calvary Kids. Okay, Pax recording. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I've served in uh, Calvary Kids for 11 years. I didn't have any gray hair before I started. <laughs> <laughs> Serving in Calvary Kids is one of my great joys. There's a beauty in seeing children come to know the Lord. For this moment in time that you have the kids in class, that they are fully attentive to you, and you have the Bible open in front of them. And it, there might not be another time during the week where they get that. If you have any desire at all to serve with kids, you will be blessed. You will be blessed. These, these kids love us. They love the Lord. I don't think there would be any other ministry that I'd rather do than, than this. The children's ministry works through the Bible, and so just being able to take all those stories and, and breaking it down to those kids' levels is, is just a lot of fun. I enjoy most 
watching kids have those light bulb moments with the Lord. I really enjoy uh, just having fun with the kids, laughing and uh, we play on the carpet and we interact in ways that are childlike, but they are scripturally based. So I believe it's building that really beautiful eternal foundation in their hearts. Come serve in Calvary Kids and make a difference in the lives of children.